Hello, and welcome back to another week of the European Tour Picks and Bets. Skylar Hoke here with Tom Jacobs. No time for an introduction because Guido Migliazzi <laughs> finished fourth in last week's United States Open, locking him up for this week's Travelers Championship, for the Open Championship, for next year's Masters, for the Olympics next month. I mean, this guy is on top of the world. Of course, John Rahm with the victory. But man, the joy I felt yesterday watching Guido play that last shot on 18, about dunked it from the fairway for an albatross. That was a special few rounds by Guido, man. Uh, what a time to be alive. I uh, I genuinely think you might be more excited than he is, and he was pretty pumped up. And you know, I mean, I, I saw someone say that his uh, his fist pump game was pretty weak, but I was pretty impressed by it. I thought he was great. Yeah. Um, you know, we can't discount anything else. But on a serious note, I mean, you know, you've been on the guy pretty much every week since uh, you know whenever he's available, we're, we're backing him. Um, and, and I said to you, didn't I, in in last week's show, you know, the guy is fin- he's doing everything he can in the fields he can. You know, the only reason every everyone doubted it because of the fact he's only done it on the European tour. That's the only opportunities he's had. This is the first time he's played the major championships. Um, you know, he's he's not played a, you know any WGC or anything like that. So he's not he's not getting the opportunities. Once he has done it, he's taken them with flying colours. Yeah, hundred percent. And the books just left it hanging for us again this week. They opened at two hundred to one. They were a little sleepy waking up course hammer that there's still triple digits out there hopefully another week he takes the you know the chance but it's just icing on the cake you know at the end of the day that was a magical performance he has set himself up for a potential pga tour card potential you know uh special temporary membership has he had another good finish this week you know within reach if not already pretty much locked in if he wanted to play the corn Ferry tour finals to get an advance to the pga tour um you know he has the ability i actually looked and kind of cross reference the european tour schedule it's three lesser events that you would miss to go play the corn Ferry finals or do the tom lewis like he did when he just showed up for the actual final event and won that and then he could come back for the Italian Open, be back in his home country, you know, to win that one too, while he wraps up the race for Dubai and 2021 just becomes the year Guido. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it doesn't take a lot, does it? I know we were pretty excited as it was. And uh, when he does things like that, it's uh, it's pretty exciting. I thought, oh, Dick Blam is going to win after uh, leading through 36. And uh, I saw he turns down points belt on Twitter for a hat sponsorship. Probably should have taken it because he's not going to get offered that again. Um, so, you know, 48 years of age, he's trying to turn back time. Um, but let's just, let's just, uh, focus on Guido and, and the, the positives from that, because it was great. And, uh, we go into another, what I think is a really decent event this week in Germany. Yeah, I'm absolutely looking forward to the BMW international open. We have quite a strong field. We play at the golf club, Munich. I can read, you know, my, my, uh, you know, I mean, look, I, I mean, terrible. I'm closer to Germany than you are and I have no idea. I mean, it, yeah, it's not for me. Just it's in Munich somewhere. It's a course I use very, very often. Uh, they rotate it, you know, every other year. So it's, it's hosted here 2011, 2013, 2015, 2017, 2019, uh, and up until 2011 before that. So, you know, when you look at these, the, the, the event form, just make sure you're not looking at 2012, 2014, or 2016, or 2018, um, if you're a course form guy now. As we spoke about um, for the European Open at, at the Porsche, we, we were looking at this event for for points as well, we, for location for. And uh, so I think I think it's still relevant, uh, in my opinion, but if you are a course form stickler, then just be aware of those days. Yeah, absolutely. And the last winner that we did see here was when he was at the peak of his game, Andrea Pavan, still fighting these shoulder injuries, teeing it up every single week, trying to, to, to get through. So he was the last winner here. We also had Andres Romero in 17 and then Pablo uh, Larothable would have been the one, uh, you know, prior to that. But we see ourselves with a really strong top of the board. You know, we have the one eyed bandit, Victor Hovland, <laughs> leaving the market. Louis Oosthuizen coming over as well, of course, after that second place finish. And Sergio Garcia, all, you know, six, seven, 11 ish to one, those three. Um, you know, we don't make our money betting these type of guys. They're coming off of a big ruling week at Tory. Um, you know, I did see they all flew, of course, BMW hooked them up this morning. Um, anybody who was coming over did have, of course, as good of a flight as you can get. But that is a big test. You know, Ches Reevy did it 
two years ago, going from Pebble Beach over to Travelers, but also we're now going from California to Germany. A um, little bit of a different game um, to say that, but is there anybody, I guess, at the top of the board, maybe under 30 to one that you think would be a strong play this week? Yeah, I mean, the one, the one that kind of frightens me a little bit is Bern Wiesberger. I mean, he, he came and he came back from the PGA Championship and played incredibly well and, and won that event there. And it, there's there's definitely chances that he can do that again this week. Uh, so 22 to 1, I thought was a pretty fair price in him considering how he plays in Germany. But Antoine Rosner um, is is the guy for, I think, both of us this week. He's, you know, he's won two of his last eight starts on the European Tour. He played incredibly well at that Memorial Tournament. I mean, the top 20 finishing that is, you know, is worth an awful lot in my eyes. Um, and it, it's, it's just a guy that, you know, I think this event is kind of, it's hard to get a real grasp of what it is that is needed here. I think that long and short hitters can prosper, but one thing's for sure is that you need to kind of avoid making bogeys, which sounds very obvious, but there's people that do it in a consistent clip. Um, and Antoine Rodson is one of those. Um, you know, he's uh, third on tour after 24 rounds, uh, 52 bogeys. So he's 2.7 bogeys around. Uh, 2.17 bows around, which is, is pretty impressive for, for the European tour. So I think that's something that was kind of stood out to me, the fact that he's got the winning upside. You know, we know what he's all about by now. Um, I don't think he's afraid of, of the competition, even with who stays in the Hovland in the field. He's just shown what he can do at the Memorial. Um, so, yeah, I thought he was a reasonable price at 28 as well. Yeah, I, I think even he opened on the state side, I man. He was like 40s at, at DraftKings Sportsbook to open. I'm more than happy with 33s out there, but I was shocked to see that 40 to one for him because that lead in form that you mentioned and what was sneaky is that the PGA championship, you know, in the two rounds, he did miss the cut. He gained seven and a half strokes gained approach in those two rounds, which is astronomical for just playing Thursday and Friday. Then he turns it around and dominates Memorial on approach to gaining almost eight strokes in those four rounds. I love trending irons. I love players that win and I love getting decent odds on them boost up by those top three guys in the field. So it's a great combination to grab Rosner 33s to 40s if they are still available 28s you know he would have been my pick of the litter at a lower price too so I was ecstatic um, to get that in there from going on beyond there I am living in this mid-range the next golfer that really stands out to me would be one that we have been talking up quite consistently for a stretch of time peaked with a second place finish, um, you know, not too long ago, also had the eighth in that same event, uh, the British Masters where Richard Bland beat Guido in that playoff, where Eduardo Molinari should realistically have wrapped up a victory there, if not potentially a another one, um, you know, not that long ago either at the BMW or at the, the last Germany event, the European Open. And then he comes out with a 35th place last week at the PGA Championship. Again, we, we had the question marks and reasons to put aside golfers that are under 12 to one, you know, on, you know, the, the travel, a little bit of, you know, the taxingness of being at the top of the leaderboard even, but, you know, Eduardo Molinari had multiple rounds where he flashed a lot of birdies last week at Torrey Pines. Of course, it is, you know, arguably way longer, way difficult, doesn't set up to his prototypical type of game, but he continues to keep that excellence rolling. So at 60 to one, I am more than willing to go back to Eduardo. The thing is with him is, is like we say, it's just purely down to the short stick. And, and we've just had on the, on the Lost Words podcast, Jason was very keen on him as well. And and the argument that one of our guests made was that, that you know, the price he's gone from when you first spoke about the 300 to one on the show, he's gone down to 60s. And I was like, yeah, but even at the 60 to one, 66 to one range, He's still priced as someone that they think can't win anymore because if he was priced as his iron play suggests he should be, he should be 25 to one, he should be 33 to one. You know, you've got Matthias Schwab up there, you've had Sean Crocker up there in recent weeks. So guys that are consistently 25, 28, 33 to one because they're they're strong irons, uh, they can't putt either. You know, Matthias Schwab cannot putt. You know, he hasn't won. Eduardo Molinari has won. I know he's 40 years of age, but he's still got plenty of time. I spoke to you. Uh, earlier, we, you know, we were messaging back and forth, and I said, you know, the guys like Jamie Donaldson, Andy Sullivan, people are later on in their career, still very, very consistent. Steve Gallagher was winning later on in his, in his advancing years. You know, if he's if he's going to hit the ball like he is, his age is not going to be a barrier. It's purely just that short game, and hopefully, at some point, uh, you know, the volatility of because he's not a guy that just gradually loses strokes. He's terrible on the greens, or he's or he's steady. And all we need from him is, is that kind of even week and uh, he can certainly contend again. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was to see kind of his run to your point of being 200s, 300s in European tour events to where he's coming at after coming off of a major. It is an impressive couple of months he has put together. Um, we are aligned on quite a few picks this week. I'll let you introduce the, the next golfer in the mid range here. Yeah, so Steven Yeager, um, he's been absolutely tearing it up on the Corn Ferry Tour. He's now got six wins on that tour, uh, one behind Jason Gore for the record at seven. The argument to having the record amount of wins on the on the Corn Ferry Tour is that you're not advancing to the PGA Tour and getting victories there. But I think, you know, he's 31 years of age. He was born in Munich, Germany. I think he's still got time on his side. I think when you look at his recent years, I think the consistency is starting to creep in. So he's a guy that... Has always been capable of going and get the win, but hasn't been able to put you know parlay it into runs. Um, but since you know he got back on the corn ferry tour last season after the restart, he's had two wins, three seconds, a fourth, a fifth, and a seventh. You know, that is incredibly consistent. And to be honest, he should have already locked up that battlefield promotion to PJ Tour. Uh, he lost in a playoff last time out. And yeah, it's just incredible. It's just incredible how well he's played. And we've already seen with David Lipsky early on in the season. Uh, you put up there in the Middle East, um, you know, this form, I think the Corn Ferry Tour is getting a lot, lot closer to the PJ Tour in terms of uh, ability levels. And I think the Challenge Tour is getting much closer to the European Tour in ability levels. And certainly, I think if you're going to cross over from the Corn Ferry over to European Tour, I think that's a better way to go. I think a lot of guys struggle going from Europe to the Corn Ferry Tour. I'd worry, you mentioned about Guido Migliotti, I think he could get caught up in the Corn Ferry. We've seen that a couple of times. I think he's actually better suited to the harder tests and the better fields than he is to try and get in those 28, 30 to, you know, 30 under bloody, you know, courses there. So I think, yeah, for me, it's 70 to one is, you know, a real good number, just the way he's been playing. And of course there is the, the worry that he can't keep it up and he can't do it on the European tour. But for me, I'm willing to take a chance at that price. Yeah, because I think the comparison, and I do the bet better events on the European tour are way higher in the official golf work world rankings or if you would say just if you're doing at a statistical stroke average and, and comparing baselines the stronger european tour events are absolutely better than the stronger corn fairy tour events corn fairy is very similar week to week but an average event you know maybe you know the handful of golfers at the top could absolutely compete week in and week out i believe on the european tour and this is that opportunity we are getting with steven yeager and it's at a number that you know arguably i anticipated lower you know mm -hmm. to see the form he's in to to make the excuses for guys at the top you know could if if steven yeager was on the european tour this season would he have similar years to golfers that are priced above you know i guess lower than him I would say he absolutely could. So yeah, to me, I think that's a no brainer bet. Um, you know, sixties to seventies, I saw available eighties, even at open, but quickly was bet down. So he was one I'm a hundred percent on when we go and continue kind of the same route of golfers that aren't on the European tour that are fighting for opportunities. Um, you know, one that we've seen cracking inside the top hundred of the world is currently sitting at number 85 is Takumi Kanaya. Takumi is somebody, you know, we saw it reach number one in the world amateur golf rankings, winning events as an amateur on the Japanese golf tour. He has racked up three uh, wins in his uh, career, won each of the years, won the Dunlop Phoenix, which is a big time event. Um, the last time out we saw him on the European tour was in Saudi, he finished 53rd, but the week before in Dubai, he had finished top 10, he was ninth that week. So we see the upside, of course, you know, you bring him over to the PGA Championship, you bring him over to the Memorial, you see back-to-back -back missed cuts, but the form on the, um, you know, Japanese golf tour, seventh, 15th, 16th, win his last four times out. Those were all events that I can absolutely see that same type of form carrying over, take advantage of the opportunity because they did announce European tour is not having Q school this year. So fighting to get status is going to be a little bit harder on the European tour. They haven't made, you know, announcements that they're taking, you know, money leaders or different things or different tours. Um, but, you know, these opportunities are really, really big for players like Kanaya to take advantage of. So I'm absolutely going back to the well with him. Yeah, I mean, we've just made two picks there in this number. And, and, and absolutely, to your point, that Kanaya was is, was great earlier in the season. Even at Saudi, where he's 53rd, he never shot worse than 72. He had that ninth place finish the week before. And and you just said that he's had two missed cuts in tournaments that you wouldn't really expect him to do well, which is why we think you know Rosner is, is boosted by that side finish at the Memorial. Um, there's no harm in missing the cut in those two events. You can't, 
you can't always do well in every single field. And and the same argument, it's not someone that I selected this week, but we, we spoke about him just before, is John Catlin. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of mis you know, I think he's kind of misrepresented. People think he can just play well on tough golf courses, and, and he can't. He can, he's very dynamic. Um, and again, his miscuts are in major championships and they're over on the PJ Tour. So he would be a guy that I wouldn't be surprised to see do well a longer number. Um, but I've slightly gone further down the board. And I'll, I'll bring up my next bet is uh, Ross Fisher. And I talked about location form with you with last time out. And he was someone I really expected to play really well in the Porsche European Open. He managed to not break 80 one round, which was devastating. But, you know, he, he really played well here. He was second to David Horsey in 2010. Um, he, he's had two missed cuts. It's the first start and the last cut here, but otherwise been 26, 12, second, 9th, 18th, 11. His irons are trending in a great direction. Um, we know he's of the quality that can win in this field. Um, and, it, and he's just always played well in Germany. So I thought the 125 to 1 number was really good on Russ Fisher. Yeah, and he, his ball striking continued too. Even though we did the miscut, the, the ball striking numbers were still decent enough at the European Open. We saw that, of course, the week before, as he showed, you know, he is one of the better prototypical ball strikers on the European Tour. It's just if that whole game can come together like it did when he chased down or was trying to chase down Burn not that long ago, it was best finish for him. Um, I'm transitioning into some deeper odds guys here, but I'm not going to sleep as great this week because, you know, if you've tracked us for the, for the year, you've known that I absolutely love to bet guys. I mean, we've already mentioned guys like a Jaeger or like a Kanaya, but I love the amateurs, love golfers that are just breaking their, their, their way through the tour. One making his pro debut, another one who played at the Scandinavian mix and did quite well. Um, we have, Vincent Norman and Elvis Smiley teeing it up this week. Do you want to tell them a little bit about Elvis Smiley? Yeah, he's he's just absolutely phenomenal. He's just his amateur career has been superb. Um, he's played you know a couple of you know pro starts, but he's you know tied second last time um, in Australia. He's had three top three finishes playing over there, um, and you know the upside on him is is absolutely superb. The thing with Smiley versus um, you know, the other guys is that we, we, you know, we just can't tell what he's going to bring. It, it's kind of an unknown quantity, which is also, I think, probably a good thing because people won't expect anything of him. Anything is a bonus. You know, he's, he's played some really phenomenal stuff um, in in fields. Okay, they are lesser known, and but we just we've just been speaking about what happens on the Challenge Tour, what happens on the Corn Ferry Tour. Over in Australia, it's not you know it's not the easiest place to go out and get victories. You see a lot of PJ Tour guys go over there and, and not necessarily get it done. Um, so he's really he's shown himself. So he's thirty third in the Australian Open, which gets a really good field. Um, so yeah, really phenomenal chances for him. Yeah, he reached as high as forty sixth um, in the World Amateur Golf Ranking. So to have that run of multiple top three finishes, you know, in some of your amateur events playing on that tour is, is big time. I think he had a 63 in there um, to push for the lead. You know, he, he's going to be a fun one to track. I, it's his pro debut. So he is, you know, getting rid of his amateur status and, and continuing on as a pro. So excited for Smiley. The way I'm going to get my exposure to him is $7,200 on DraftKings this week. It's just a steal of a price. I'm going to, you know, work on getting him in a good amount of lineups to continue, you know, to get these guys at low ownership, just like Vincent Norman was as the Scandinavian mix. Him and Ludwig uh, Aberg, I believe, was the other one who were really, really strong, um, you know, amateurs out of Sweden. If you looked at Vincent Norman, he went out of Florida State. So teammates with John Pock, um, who, you know, was the one who led the PGA Tour University, um, getting sponsors exemptions. But Vincent Norman was up to fourth uh, in the World Amateur Golf Rankings, uh, had a few wins to his name. And just like Last week at the Scandinavian Mix, he did finish 12th in that event. Aberg, Aberg had finished 30th, but if you track Norman, I tweeted about him a little bit, you know, that course was wide open. It had the ability to just absolutely bomb it, but he was hitting drives 380 plus, 390. He was over 400 on a couple drives, which of course was baked out. You could run it up the fairway, but this guy's ball striking last week was absurd. So or I guess two weeks ago on the European tour. And then he comes through with a 12th place finish on his, you know, pro, I guess, I don't, I don't think he still has amateur status. Um, 
yeah, so, you know, I think he presents a lot of upside. But again, winning for these guys is a lot in this type of field. So I'm going to swallow my pride and not bet them. But again, you know, we get that DraftKings discount for it. Norman is only $6,800 this week. So I think both of them are really good plays on DraftKings. So that's where I'm going to be getting exposure to these two. Um, but we go a little bit deeper. There's another guy that we have seen, if we talk about lesser tours and the challenge tour continues some hot form and now is rolling into the European tour start. Um, can you break down that play for us? Yeah, just just one more word on Elvis Smiley. I think that he hasn't yeah. really been missed this week, has he? He's he kind of 100, 100 to 1, 140 to 1. I think that's the kind of thing for me that kind of suggests that, you know, maybe maybe just wait a week, you know, maybe just wait a week to play him as, as a bet because if he has a bad week or, you know, he just misses a cut or he, he finishes 50, if he could be 300 to 1 this next time, slightly deeper field again, um, that's kind of the way I look at it. I don't know about Vincent Norman, whether he may have been pulled out. I'm just looking at this, this, the odds there and it may be just, I spell his name wrong, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm odds checker. So if you do that, there's one R versus two R. So if you go a little bit deeper, his last name's N-O-R-R-M-A-N. So some books have a different, which when you look in that format, that is exactly what happens. That's why you're going to confuse him. And it beats people like me. So there we go. <laughs> um, but Ewan Ferguson, 200 to one. Um, he has been playing phenomenal golf on the Challenge Tour. Um, over his last seven appearances, he's been second, fourth, and third. He's also got an 11th and a 36th place finish there as well. Um, this is a guy that's been talked about for a little while now. It's, you know, a Scottish guy, and he's he's expected to go on and do really good things. And we see we see some people take a little bit longer than others, and he's not old by any means, and he's not that far into his career by any means. I think it's just the expectation was quite high on him. And because he didn't deliver straight away, people kind of went, oh, he's, it's just another one. He's just another guy. And I don't think he is. I think, you know, he's 200 to one this week. And just, just from what he's been doing, I mean, those those last couple of events have been on the same golf course in the second and 11th. But, you know, I, I, I truly do believe that he can make the step up. And I think this is an event that can, can uh, offer opportunities to him. I have, I guess, two and a half things to say about Ferguson. I'm, I'm on with you with him, but one, I don't think we've talked about this yet. Do you know where his best performance was? No. In the European tour, best performance. Belgian knockout, Guido's win there. <laughs> I believe Guido knocked him out. Um, he beat Van, just to break hearts. I think he beat Van Driel in the finals, but Ferguson was in the final four of that event. But they also are a part of the same Niall Horan, Modest Golf. Yeah. Um, and I, I will credit Niall Horan, man. He does a great job of finding these younger, higher profile amateurs, golfers that are trying to you know, cut their teeth on the European tour and get them into stars. So he, he's really having a, a budding golf agency. So that's the one and a half. The second part is I thought this was interesting. So Robin McIntyre um, did a little q and a as he traveled uh, over to Tory from being back home and someone asked him who is the best golfer out, out there that you play with who hasn't made the leap yet and and it was Ferguson is who he tagged him so you know I always love hearing from golfers on talents and, and peers in that sense so I thought that incredibly interesting that Bob you know kind of highlighted Ferguson because he has shown these flashes so yeah I it was low as 125s here in the states as well as available I'd still accept that 200s was the best that was out there um so yeah I, I definitely in on Ferguson and then the last play for me is and this is very interesting again we're making up our card of a mixture primarily of, you know, four guys who, who aren't steady European tour players, but this is, you know, a two time major winner in the year of 2021 who has the opportunity if he wanted to play in the third major of the year on the champions tour this week, Alex Czechia is passing up the players championship, which is a legit major on the champions tour and, and deciding, Hey, I'm going to go, you know, play at home in the BMW International Open. And I'm going to give this a shot. I'm in the form of my life right now. Why not try to make another run at this? Saw the resurgence of Phil, saw what's happening. You know, maybe, you know, this is just a 50 year old's game now and we're back in action. I mean, he has finishes of second, first, 26th, first, 11th, you know, 55th was the one, you know, most recently. But man, to have the number available 200 to one, again, I I'm not. 
as statistical in, in being able to break down the actual stroke difference from the champions tour to the European tour. I'm sure there's a large gap in some senses, but in the weaker versus the best fields, how is that gap? I, I, I don't really have a, a number to compare, but I thought it was quite odd to see Czechia at 200 to one this morning when he has shown that, that breakthrough on the champions tour. Of course, you know, Phil, Phil did it. A couple wins for Phil. Do we see Czechia now, you know, being able to bring that back and translate some sort of game? I'm willing to take the gamble at 200 to one. I think the thing is with Czechia is that, you know, like you say, the two championships, championships tour victories are, I guess, it does that kind of blind our view. And I, what I would say is that this is a guy that's won at every level that he's ever played at. He won four times on the Challenge Tour. Then he won again four times on the European Tour before he departed his coast to the PGA Tour. Then he won the Puerto Rico Open in 2015. Almost broke that curse before anybody else by try, uh, losing the playoff at the Shriners in 2017. You know, yes, it's been four years, but he's only four years removed from really contending for a PGA Tour victory. I, I spoke to you earlier about it. It was a case of like, you know, yes, he's playing really well in Champions Tour, but is it a case that he hasn't contended enough in recent years at this level? But it's going to be such a renewed confidence. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's pretty good friends with Bert Wiesberger, so he's probably going to play some pressure trends with him. I mean, what a guy to be bouncing off at the moment. Uh, he's winning two major championships on the Champions Tour, Bert Wiesberger's in the form of his life again, so there's going to be some serious action in that uh, practice round. So for me, I don't think there's really much to it. I think that if you if you like him, if you like what he's doing, um, then certainly take a chance on him, because like you say, he's giving up a really good opportunity on the other side of the world. Uh, to come over here. And I guess there's probably links to the fact that it's his, his home event and it's the BMW and they're big supporters of golf. But, you know, when he's 50 years of age, he's kind of got to look after himself and he's, he's opting to do it. He doesn't have to do it. I don't, I don't suppose he's obliged to do it. I don't suppose it's just a sponsor thing. And if it is, then then maybe that's all it is. But, you know, for me, I was quite happy with that. Just just going back to you and Ferguson, it's an interesting point you, you say about what Robert McIntyre said, because I think he's going to be a great judge of, of character. Um, but it's easy to forget that he was on that Walker Cup team that uh, was in 2015, and, and they beat uh, a team that had Bryson DeChambeau, Bo Hostler, Maverick McNeely, who who, uh, who he beat in a singles match on the Friday. So you know, I Bob think that's... at that at that Walker Cup, Bob just destroyed Cameron Champ. That's one of my favorite facts. So there's like six and four or something like that. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. You know, these guys are just. They're good, and 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 they come out of these amateur events, and people think that they they're just going to have to hit the ground running. You know, we saw it with people like Ashley Chester. Well, I've referenced him an awful lot, and again, he's another guy that could have a chance this week. Um, you know, when he come out and play really well as an amateur at the St Andrews, it you know everyone just piles and piles and piles this expectation on them, and if they don't do it within one year, it's like okay, well, who's the next guy? And because we got spo- we get spoiled by the guys of Morikawa and Wolves and, and people like that. And it, Normans last week when they play so well in as an amateur even still Elvis Smiley another one as soon as they start showing any promise at such a young age it's like right when are they going to win and sometimes it just takes people to to sharpen their teeth and, and get into it it's, pro golf is so tough and people really don't give it the the credit it is um, a couple of other long shots for me uh, Jack's Croix fix the South African he was second and ninth in his last two recorded starts in strokes gain approach. Um, he missed the cut last time out on the Challenge Tour, but before that, I mean, he was in, in incredible form. He had one one finish outside the top 20, three inside the top six over sort of seven or eight events. And Reese Enoch as well, I thought was actually in better form than, than he's really given credit for. I mean, he, I think he had the top 30 finish there at the Porsche European Open, but of course it was cut short uh, to three rounds uh, where he was tied 29th. And then he backed out with a tied 12 finish at the Scandinavian Mix. I mean, this is a guy that's, been rejuvenated this season. He had that win on the uh, on the Sunshine Tour, and then again twentieth in Kenya. So really, for me, he's been he's been pretty steady. Twentieth in uh, Savannah, twenty third at Canary Islands, 29th and twelfth the last two times out. It's purely just a prize play for me. I don't see any reason why it would particularly suit him. I don't know if it's even really the perfect event for him. But just I just thought the numbers a bit long on someone that's actually in a steady form. I certainly think he'd, he'd make up some good drafting things. Yeah, he's definitely touched the the front page of the leaderboard, the number one spot, multiple events over the last month, um, which, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Enoch's price, let's see here. He would be on DraftKings for the week. Just had it pulled up. As I pull it up, let me see. He is. Come on, Sky, you had this ready to go. 
Okay. Reese is $6,600. You know, another great value play. The $100 lower than him, who I'm really excited for the return. I don't really know why he was out for an extended period of time. I'm rather certain it has to be injury related, but I was a huge Hugo Leon fan um, yeah. when he was having status on the European tour. Um, you know, he was always in the off the tee plus approach ball striking categories, just incredibly, um, you know, popping for his price, horrible putter. If you watch him putting on the greens, from what I remember, it's like a bent over like Matt Kuchar esque on, you know, extreme 90 degree angle putting, but he rocks a tiger's hat. I respect that as a tiger's fan. Um, so Hugo Leone's 400 to one 6,500, um, you know, top 20 potentially in him, but he finished 13th on the challenge tour after a miscut the week before, you know, I'm not chancing him in any of the markets. I'll probably play him on DraftKings, but I'm hoping his return is more permanent. Um, and he can kind of make up for some opportunities that he's getting as he has, you know, fringe, um, status still that he could get into some events if he wants to tee it up. So Hugo would be kind of another deep dark shout out, but I think that kind of puts a wrap on my thoughts. Anybody else down there, Tom, that you have any in? No, Hugo is tied 13th in his last heart and challenge tour, which is, again, like we said, we keep trying to drill it home, but we don't really think there's much in terms of uh, quality difference in those kind of two events. You know, if, if someone like you and Ferguson is, is steamrolling his way through the challenge tour, you're expecting to make, you know, make up the ground. So, so yeah, I, I guess there, there's probably a few guys at the bottom there, but I think when he gets this lower range, it, it's really hard. I think the European tour is a little bit more volatile in, in the 6K range than maybe the PJ tour. I think because the PJ tour field quality are a lot deeper, it's it's easier to shoehorn some people in. Um, and I think you, you kind of live in that 7,000 range. I mean, like Ross Fisher's there at 72 um you know you who me to I seven four you know you can build a really solid lineup and get John Catlin seven eight and you can really get those top guys in I mean I think if you start with Bert Wiesberg or Anton Rosner and you can fill it out after that I think that's gonna be a really solid lineup and they boosted the the prize pools 5k to first um so excited to go in for that and you know again this field is stronger than your typical European tour event because we have the three big dogs at the top you know, we're just taking our chances with golfers who potentially are, you know, not given the opportunities like we've mentioned with Guido and Higo as we go in, you know, these are, you know, potentially career changing opportunities for some of these golfers, like we have seen these ones that we love and adore in the European tour make when they get to the PGA tour. So we're expecting that to happen, hopefully with a few of our other guys. So Tom, can you run down your betting card one more time? Yeah, absolutely. So Antoine Rosner for me was kind of a standout value at the top of the market. Um, I do like Bernd Wiesberger at a slightly shorter price, but I think I would definitely try and put him in my DraftKings team. Stephen Yeager there at 70 to 1. Ross Fisher at 125 to 1. Ewan Ferguson at 200 to 1. And then I'll look at ways to put Jack Ruschwick and Reese Enoch into uh, maybe some DraftKings, maybe into some uh, top 20 bets, because I think the winning upside is is slightly less. But I just, just very quickly while we were talking about DraftKings, DraftKings, because sometimes it's, it's not something I always look at, but you could put a team together of Bert Wiesberger, Anton Rosen, Steen Yeager, Takumi Kanai, Ross Fisher, and Ewan Ferguson. And I thought it was a really, really steady team. You know, Ewan Ferguson being the, the rank outsider in that team was pretty impressive. Um, you know, it does does demand him making a step up to the European Tour, which he hasn't done all the time. But for me, there's you know, starting those two off in, uh, in Wiesberger and Rosner is really a strong way to go. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. If we go through my betting cards at the top, Antoine Rosner, you know, he was the longest 40 to one, Eduardo Molinari, 60s, Kanaya, 66, Jaeger, 70, and then both Czechia and Ferguson on the state side, they were 125s, but they were 200 to one overseas. So I think those guys present a ton of each way opportunity up and down the board, but we wish you guys a ton of luck this week. We're ready. We're back with a Thursday start, a, a normal event on the European tour to get things rolling a little bit. And again, there there is open qualification for those guys at the top. If they weren't already exempt, the European tour, or the RNA is going to take the top five golfers who are not already qualified for the open championship, who are inside the top 20 of the race to Dubai standings. So five of those golfers, Guido currently heads that market. He cannot be passed by others. So he, well, four others, he could not be the first one, but he has locked up his five in the open championship. So there is some skin in the game from that standpoint too, before we get to the qualifying portion in these specific events. But we wish you all the best of luck this week. Go Guido at the Travelers and go good luck here at the Germany uh, BMW International Open. So good luck, everybody. 